morning, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I'm not a uh, cultural diploma diplomatic uh, specialist, uh, but I've been so humbled and honored by the invitation in the first instance, and um, because it gives me to the opportunity to give a few perspectives on not just on the problems of Africa or facing us in Africa, rather how we can advance on the achievements of the last uh, 20 years. So I chose, I had the opportunity to make a choice of uh, topic myself, and I chose to speak on uh, media, diplomacy, and vocational education in, in Africa. So um, unfortunately, the time hadn't permitted me to uh, make a formal uh, PowerPoint presentation for the symposium lecture. Uh, so I made a, a short, a brief uh, speech, which I hope uh, you to interrupt me anytime if you hadn't understood anything, or so so that we flow together. So um, once again, it's an honor to speak on cultural diplomacy <laughs> before experts. And uh, I started by going a little bit into cultural diplomacy, the way layman will understand it, uh, to being a derivative of culture itself, which is a system of shared beliefs, uh, values, and practices by a group or subgroups in a geographical environment. And this transcends generations and occasionally borders. In recent times, there has been a wave of new cross-border and common interest-based popular cultures, uh, which is often not devoid of the controversies, and it is a determined departure from the classical definition and understanding of culture. So because we see nowadays that um, classically, culture has been defined as uh, being from a cluster group of people uh, of their shared common, uh, shared values over the centuries, and the, and the desire to go on, go ahead with, um, with this culture and defend this culture from outsiders or from outside influences. So, but uh, in the last 20 years, we see that the um, definition of culture has been internationalized. The, this broader thing is being uh, broken down. And the, uh, gradually, cultural definition of certain norms could no longer be a prerogative of a certain group. The basis of a city uh, that is cultural diplomacy is one of direct communication with foreign people with the aim of affecting their thinking and ultimately that of their governments. CD therefore can be seen as a set of activities directed abroad in the fields of information, education and culture. And the objective is to influence a foreign government by influencing its citizens. It is a software and the CD practice makes it possible to achieve maximum positive image through convincing rather than coercion of payments. Through CD, it becomes relatively easier for a nation to obtain goodwill in another country. And this one we can see, I'm sure there's nobody uh, sitting down here who doesn't know Gothe Institute. Uh, it is a German establishment, it's a cultural group. Uh, and it operates worldwide, and this has helped to accentuate the positive image of Germany in almost every country on this globe. And uh, if uh, people in Burundi or Ghana could have benefited in one way or another from Gothe Institute, then it's the positive image of the country where Gothe Institute uh, it comes from is definitely projected. Not until recently, after the fall of, that is uh, the beginning of the 90s, the late 80s, as the re invaluable relevance of cultural diplomacy come to the form forefront of international politics, peace and conflict resolution, the need to create an informal ad hoc basis to counter increasing international conflicts has forced the hands of international diplomats and policymakers to adopt non-confrontational principles of cultural diplomacy. In this way, many conflicts have been stopped from escalating. 
nations have hitherto made maximum use of their cultural, diplomatic, economic, and political institutions as means of communicating their cultural policies abroad. And over the years, cultural diplomacy has become a form of international communication. Having said this, if uh, cultural diplomacy is the machine for mutual communication, democratization, economic development, human rights, through which conflicts could be resolved without armed confrontation, then it will be correct to assume that a functional, people-driven, value-based, and non-ideological public media is the oil that drives this machine. Um, in this way, I am trying to um, accentuate the real importance of um, public media that is people driven not based on any ideological left or link, uh, left or right or center, in projecting the interests of a certain cultural interest of a certain group of people. So, um, because nowadays we see that the um, communication is becoming global and the, the language is not often defined. So, and I think uh, people have actually come together by communicating, talking with more, more another, they, they've been able to understand more of what the other is doing. This has increased confidence uh, among peoples in the world, and it is really difficult to really uh, put a uh, percentage, a statistics of what cultural diplomacy has actually achieved. Uh, Mariette Schake, she is a Dutch uh, member of uh, the Dutch Liberal Party in Holland, presented a paper in December of 2010 on cultural diplomacy, and she went a little bit further to declare that culture actions are used to foster, to foster democratization, participation, development, education, human rights, and freedom of expression. Culture is increasingly being recognized as a vehicle to accomplishing other goals that are more value-oriented. By linking it to common values such as democratization, human rights, and freedom of expression, uh, cultural diplomacy is the exten extension becoming a value-oriented oriented terminology which is beyond a particular country. As I uh, mentioned earlier on, um, you don't have to be an expert to practice or to project your culture. Uh, you only find need to be self-confident and know exactly what your culture is all about, and you'll be so fascinated that a lot of people want to know more about you. By linking it to common values such as human rights and freedom of expression, uh, cultu uh, um, cultural diplomacy is by extension becoming a value-oriented terminology which is beyond a particular country, geographical zone, or religion. Rather, it becomes a universal language understood by all. Now we go back a little bit to Africa, which is the topic of today. Uh, the problems of Africa today, there are so many. And I try to sum them up to by going back a little bit to how maybe Africa got to the present situation it is and what to do to get, get out of it and not to remain inside. Uh, to understand how Africa got into its present social political predicaments, a short review of its history becomes imperative. Regarded as the most divided continent in the world, Africa has a population of over 930 million in 54 fully independent and nine non-sovereign states. There are not less than 3,000 ethnic groups on the continent, with a large country like Nigeria having over 370. Over 2,000 different languages are spoken, and the dividing lines between cultures and religions in Africa do not match national borders, but rather occur across and within states thereby creating a complex socio-political environment, a condition dating back from the Berlin Conference. So in this situation uh, in Africa, as I'm sure we Africans know, is that um, 
the acceptance of national demarcations is limited. So because uh, you might have somebody of your culture, of your tribe, of your religion, just a few kilometers away, who lives, happen to live in the next country. So, but people have over the years refused to be demarcated by natural borders, as was dictated or as were dictated uh, during the Berlin Conference. So in spite of the natural borders that we have in Africa today, um, it has been a blessing because people have ignored them and been able to interact with one another regardless of this border, but it has also been a cause because it has been a point of conflict over the years. At the time of the conference, 80% of Africa was under traditional and local control. Then Africa was divided into 50 irregular nations. This new map of the continent was superimposed over the 1,000 indigenous cultures and re regions of Africa. The new countries, they lack the rhyme or reason, and they really did not understand how to get along with one another. So at this point, to, I want to mentioned that uh, to understand, to comprehend the use of times in this lecture, uh, media diplomacy should not be confused with the use of media in diplomacy or the impact of media on diplomatic practices. It should equally not be seen to be the same as mainstream media practices. The first two times refer to classical diplomatic practices between nations. Mainstream media, on the other hand, is currently in the process of defining itself. Uh, mainstream media, we know, is the uh, classical newspapers, uh, print, and all those things. And um, we also know that a lot of newspapers are closing down right now because of challenges being posed by access to information or news on the internet, which is global and instant. In this context, or the context of this lecture, I want to define media diplomacy or digital diplomacy as the aspect of cultural diplomacy powered by digital internet communication and the potential this offers to practitioners of cultural diplomacy in Africa. The internet has become an international property devoid of physical natural borders. Properly employed, the new media can help to foster values such as freedom of expression access to information and democratic participation. So international social media such as Facebook and Twitter, Yahoo, Google, MSN, and so on, provide the platforms to hundreds of millions of users daily to communicate with one another. Bloggers are basically the journalists of today. So that means um, Right now, there might not be people from the mainstream media here, but each one of us could transmit exactly what is going on now, right live to the rest of the world. It's become so easy. So almost everybody with a multimedia a mobile phone and internet connection uh, has become the journalist of today. So people don't really need to wait so long to get news. This is the new reality of communication and expression, which has brought immeasurable benefits. For example, thousands, thousands of people across Arab, Arabic nations were able to accentuate their aspirations for more freedom, resulting in the overthrow of many dictatorial, dictatorial regimes. So the first part of the discussion we devote to how the benefits of internet communication can help, will help Africa to accelerate its various declared development objectives. The other part deals with the relevance of high quality vocational education and the potentials this holds for the continent. For understanding, the economy of Germany is made up of 99%. That means uh, of the, of 100 companies in this country, 99 of them are small and medium enterprises. And if you look at the staff, the workers in these employees in these companies, close to 80% of them are graduates of um, vocational training. 
In comparison to many other European countries, Germany has the low and lowest number of university graduates, but the biggest, most functional, and dynamic economy. But the engine of growth in Germany is the highly qualified vocational trainees. If it works for Germany, it will work in Africa. I hope to discuss how African nations, through effective combination of media and cultural diplomacies, effectively, effectively achieve many of their development agendas. So now you ask yourself, how can Africa apply internet to uh, technology to advance its declared growth objectives? The adoption of technology is the cornerstone of economic development because we see this. Um, about 35 years ago, uh, China was a struggling economy. The same thing for India. So but if you look at the countries in the Southeast Asia, going also to the Southwest, uh, South Korea, Indonesia, and uh, recently Vietnam, they were able to quicken the gap between the West with highly advanced technology and the, 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 these countries because they adopted technology to the fullest. The basis for internet technology revolution will be how to connect, as far as Africa is concerned now, will be how to connect African countries with each other and eventually to the rest of the world through high-speed telecommunication cables. This will support broadband that transmits information at very fast speed. But right now, lack of Adequate broadband connections has been the major hindrance to Africa's promotion of greater information and, tech, uh, and communication tech. There are a very few direct high-capacity internet links between African nations. Uh, to accentuate this example, uh, the Republic of Benin and Burkina Faso, they are neighbors. However, internet traffic between them passes through France or Canada. So, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't it have been easier, quicker, if they are linked? So this is a big problem in Africa. And in the course of pro preparing this uh, brief uh, presentation, I have seen that um, a lot of achievements have been made between African nations and the rest of the world in the West, specifically and America. But so little has been done within African nations among themselves to understand themselves culturally, to try to grow together organically, and to try to understand one another. So little has been understood. Uh, an African diplomat, uh, so, um, cultural diplomat, or uh, cultural diplomacy practitioner understands what is going on in Germany or in France better than what is going on in his neighboring nation in Af back in Africa. So I think uh, this could be changed by adopting more technology and more investment in uh, internet technology. For example, the importance of internet is, can be seen because in its brief life, it has evolved into an agent of revolutionary change in health, education, journalism, politics, and other sectors. And it is increasingly being used to transmit life-saving medical information, coordinate relief for victims of natural disasters, and provide uncensored information to people trapped under repressive regimes. The social media, media could also serve as carriers of knowledge and skills to Africa. Right now, in Africa, there are 53 million Facebook and 11 million Twitter users on the continent, and each of these is capable of assisting to facilitate quality training to the continent. The enthusiasm with which Africans have adopted the new technology is the la in the last decade as can be better used to deliver grassroots knowledge and trainings. The same development happened um, in mobile telephony connectivity. There's also a relatively, this is also a relatively new technology to Africa. And at the start of 2012, there were some 650 million mobile subscriptions. 
making Africa mobile telephony markets bigger than either the U EU or the United States. Here, for example, if because uh, almost everybody is having a mobile phone in Africa right now, why not develop applications, uh, training applications, which can easily be used to train people? You know, I think we don't really have to struggle too much with university education in Africa because the university education is not the real basis for growth. And uh, as I personally believe um, we need to concentrate much more on uh, vocational training because vocational training is easier to um, bring to the people and immediately you enable somebody, you give somebody perspective for, its, for his or her life and you know, anybody that you can take away from the street, training him or her, you know, you have less problem as a, as, as a leader of your country. So I strongly believe in the, in the scheme, in this uh, uh, vocational training scheme. Following the initiative of Max Planck Institute of Germany here in Berlin, that is the third aspect of uh, information dissemination or information enablement that I believe strongly. To promote unrestricted and open access to scientific knowledge and cultural heritage. Um, the initiative was from Max Planck Institute of Berlin, of Germany. That means right now, um, a lot of scientific and is, uh, academic institutions in Germany and all over the world, they are right now willing to share knowledge so if they are willing to share knowledge, is Africa ready to take this knowledge? You see, we have to make use of more, more use of what is available to us free of charge in Africa. We don't always have to pay for a lot of things, what you can get free. And the giver is, at the moment, a willing giver. So I believe that the opportunity, such opportunities must be fully utilized. Technical skills in, for example, automotive engineering and electronics, mechatronics, mechanized agricultural competence, etc., could be transported digitally to African nations and help it to expand in its cap capacity building. Technical and vocational training has emerged as one of the most effective human resource development strategies that African countries need to embrace in order to train and modernize their technical workforce for rapid industrialization and natural, national development. In order for technical and vocational education to effectively support industrialization, economic growth, wealth creation, and poverty eradication, skill training must be of high quality and competence-based, and it must be it must incorporate the use of modern information and technology, uh, communication technologies. It must be relevant to the needs of the industry, the local industry. It must be ef efficient and adaptable to the changing technological work environments. Possible training subjects include solar technology, farming equipment repairs, industrial mechanics, building technology, tile and wood, wooden floor technology, welding technology, agricultural and crop management, sewing and embroidery, carpentry and wood, 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 for, uh, wood force. Um, my work at the embassy, I have been exposed to the, a, a bitter truth that uh, you find out that a lot of Nigerians, they come to Germany here to, bring, to take somebody from Germany who is going to lay their tiles who's going to put the wooden uh, floors, who's going to wire the houses. There are also requests for housemeisters from Germany to manage facilities in Nigeria. You see, I don't know how this could be possible because the investment to train people is so minimal to how much you're going to pay like 20 people coming, leaving Germany for Nigeria to work. So this is an area where we have 
not been taken seriously in Africa, you know, we need to really, really, really enable our youth. Moreover, professional training must facilitate integration into the labor market, not theory-based. The, the taught subjects must be really relevant to the market that immediately after graduation, uh, graduates uh, flow straight into the workforce, into the market, and they are able to join the economic chain. I find that computer literacy is also relevant to all occupations now. Take it or leave it. If you are comp com computer illiterate, phew, it's not good to be computer illiterate now. Presently, the delivery status of vocational education in Africa is characterized by weak national economies, huge number of poorly educated, unskilled, and unemployed youth, educated but unemployed, college and university graduates. Uh, we see in Africa that uh, maybe due to the influence of colonialism or colonial cultural education or cultural situation, we laid so, place so much emphasis on university polytechnic trainings. But now, if you want to produce so many graduates, university graduates, you must have an economy that will give employment to them. So I, again, I, will, I beg to take another example from Nigeria where certainly we have, we produce every year more graduates, university graduates than Germany. And what happens to these graduates after graduation? They eventually, they have no jobs because the economy, the local economy cannot, is not strong enough to present them opportunities of jobs. So what they do is now to go back to using their skill now to go back to vocational training to upgrade themselves and be relevant to the, to the uh, society. Another problem is the, is the inadequate financing. This is caused maybe by willingness or lack of it of countries to place, to prioritize their assessment of uh, how, what, uh, where they are taking their countries as long, as far as uh, uh, vocational education is concerned. But right now, the relevance of this education is just beginning to sink in. Another problem being faced by vocational training in Africa is poor public perception. Vocational education graduates are generally viewed, viewed as lowly and irrelevant. This attitude has to change in future. In this regard, I would like to suggest a rethink in the approach to vocational education planning. Many countries have chosen the way of expending millions of dollars on sending trainees in many areas of vocation to Western European countries, only to get back to Africa and become redundant after completion of their programs. The reason for this is the unavailability of necessary training facilities and a different work environment back at home. This practice is unsustainable. The rethink here is to, for example, through cultural diplomacy, make it easy, possible and attractive for foreign trainers to travel to Africa and assist in training the locals. That means uh, instead, instead of spending about half a million to train 15 people here in Germany, why don't you spend that half a million to bring in competent trainers, provide the infrastructure, the training facilities in Africa, bring in a few trainers from here and train hundreds of your people in your local environment. Nevertheless, this will still require the support and financing commitment of respective authorities in Africa who will provide this facilities and infrastructure. The advantages of this are obvious. As I mentioned above, the training will take place in a rural, local working environment, and graduates easily float into the local economies and join the economic chain of the society. And I believe, if properly managed, 
a country can successfully train a minimum of 150,000 persons per annum using this reverse thinking strategy. A distinction could also be made because the next, the next question to ask is, how do you create capacity or training for those school dropouts who never really went to, who never really enjoyed real education in their lives? But we have to distingu distinguish between professions with advanced pre-requirements of skill and those with minimum requirements. But in whichever way, beneficiaries will have received high quality training. Let us not forget that the ready availability of highly trained local working strength in, con in combination with other factors is one of the reasons for new investment, foreign investments in the country. For example, um, a small company, a German company trying to go to Nigeria to invest, really wants to know how much is it going to cost me to produce in Nigeria. Now, if I take a machine, set of machines worth $5 million or euro to Nigeria or anywhere in Africa, do I have competent people who can man these machines? You know? So it's a major factor of determination of where to invest. So if a country is able to offer foreign investors, local, well-trained local personnel, be sure that new investments will come because every company is always looking for a place to produce cheaper. I want to now, before I round up, uh, discuss a little bit on the challenges facing development objectives of Africa. And I will quote Mrs. Wangari Matai. We know uh, the Kenya a Nobel Prize winner in 2004, um, when she was presenting a paper on the fourth UN uh, World Women's Conference in 1995 in Beijing. She listed likely factors such as the absence of peace and security in Africa, so the problems facing, uh, the possible reasons why Africa could not realize the objectives of his vision and this permits everywhere in Africa. Wars have created an atmosphere of insecurity and instability, which in turn has affected the growth of solid democratic and economic structures on the continent. The side effects of these failures include failure of the rule of law and justice, as well as the resulting massive official corruption in almost every country in Africa. Also, she identified destructive style of political and economic leadership and a frustrated democratization process. Ignorance and corruption, as well as power supply. We know Africa uh, in the last seven years um, has been witnessing on the average a GDP growth rate of about 6% every year. In comparison, um, Germany struggles to get to 1%. So if a continent or if a country can grow at 6% regularly, constantly for a couple of years, that means your requirements of energy supply is going up. That means you need massive investment in power supply, in the power sector, how to generate more electricity using natural resources that you have at your disposal, solar and others, water, thermal, because uh, as the, as the economy grows, you need to develop your capacity in this respect. I want to touch before I round up again on the literacy statistics for Sub-Saharan Africa, which I believe is really demoralizing. Because we talk, we can talk a lot about public diplomacy, media this, media that, but if the people are not included, if most of your people are not even in the um, condition of understanding your message, then you have got no message. For example, more than one in three adults cannot read. One, 176 million adults are unable to read and write. 
47 million youth from the age of ages of 15 to 24, they are illiterate. 21 million adolescents are not in school, and 32 million primary school aged children are not in school as well. This is not good enough. But these figures may be discouraging at first glance, but a lot has been achieved in the last 20 years. Finally, two African nations, Nigeria and South Africa, are listed on the so-called Next 11. This is a list of the biggest economies by 2050. In order to live up to this international confidence, the continent needs to develop its own growth path and the instruments to chart the path. It is my conviction that concerted and serious investments in high quality vocational and technical training schemes using basic social media and other intellectual and research open, resource, open sources powered by digital technology will quicken the pace of achievements. In, two, in December 2011, The Economist published a special report titled Africa Rising. Hmm. This, the magazine revised its labeling of Africa a decade earlier as the hopeless continent. Today, I joined The Economist to pronounce Africa as the hopeful continent. Thanks for the audience. <laughs>